today we're going to be looking at verse 13. The title of the sermon is called, Who is Wise? Who is Wise? So let's, for context, read all the way to the end of the chapter, but we will start at verse 13. So let us give attention to the reading of God's word. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is God's holy and inspired word. May he add his blessing to it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we are thankful once again to open the book of James, a book that confronts us, a book that teaches us how we are to live in light of the faith we have been given. So Lord, we pray that you would help us as we seek to look to Christ for all wisdom. Help us then to manifest the same wisdom as we look to him. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Do you consider yourself wise? We'd all love to say yes. I don't think there's anyone here who says, no, I'm, I'm a fool. But today, James is actually going to tell us if we have true wisdom or not. He's going to say, if you claim to be wise, let's examine it. So remember who James has been writing to. He is writing to believers who have been scattered. He is a pastor of the church of Jerusalem. He is writing to people who used to go to his church, but because of hardships and persecution, they have been pressed out into the nations. So he's writing to them to encourage them, to motivate them, but also he wants them to see, are you maturing in the faith? Are you growing and are you exhibiting the fruit of true faith. So he gives them a series of tests. Test to see, do you have true, genuine, living faith? And so, as you have true faith, he's wanting us to show that this is going to be demonstrated in the life you live. And so he gave various tests, and so far we have seen that true faith endures through trials. True faith resists temptations. True living faith hears the word of God and seeks to do it. True living faith cares for the helpless and the needy. True living faith doesn't show partiality. And true living faith has deeds. It has works. And we saw that justification is made visible in the court of human opinion by the fruit of good works. So because we've been justified by grace through faith in Christ, it will then show in the good deeds that we do. In chapter 3, James has been teaching us so far the importance of the tongue, the importance of a controlled tongue in particular, a tame tongue. And he says that's actually a mark of a redeemed person. It's a mark of maturity. And so we have the test of the tongue. Are you able to control your tongue? We've seen that that's only possible because of the work of Christ in us, because of the work of the Spirit in us to help us to have controlled and tamed tongues. For apart from that, it's impossible for mere man. Even though we may be redeemed, it's still easy because we, we still wrestle in the sinful flesh, so it's easy to have a slip of tongue. It's easy to fall. And so he gives the warning, not many should become teachers, my brothers, because there's a stricter judgment. Since the chief instrument of teachers is to use their tongue, it's easy for them to stumble. And so he says, not many should be teachers. But we also saw that James doesn't limit this warning to teachers. He doesn't say only teachers need to have a controlled tongue, but he broadens it out to say, if you're a believer, you too ought to be aware and guarded about your tongue. You should take great care knowing the power of the tongue, that it can do great good, but it could also bring about great destruction. And he gave the analogy of the fire in a forest that goes ablaze. He says, so too is your tongue left uncontrolled. James now comes to the test of wisdom. The test of wisdom. True faith will be seen 
in wisdom. And it's not just any wisdom. He wants us to know that there is a godly wisdom. There is a godly wisdom that is a mark of a mature Christian, but it still involves your speech. In light of the context, he is dealing with the tongue. And so we'll still see that, but this also involves all of life, wisdom in light of all of life. Now in this section, we're going to see this as one unit, verses 13 to 18. And we can see, we can break this up into three sections. And in verse 13 here, which we're going to be looking at, James is giving us the question of wisdom, followed by a biblical answer of what it, lo- what it looks like. But then he wants us to know, you, do you have the right kind of wisdom? If you claim to be wise, which wisdom do you have? Is it a worldly wisdom or a heavenly wisdom? In verse 16, 14 to 16, he shows the worldly wisdom. In verse 17 to 18, he then shows the godly wisdom. So he contrasts the two, and then he wants us to see which one do you have. The kind of wisdom you have will be revealed through the life you live, through the words you say, through your conduct and interactions. And today, we're just going to be considering verse 13 and how it relates mainly to our speech. And the next time, we'll be looking at the others. So the big idea I have for us today is, if we are to be mature Christians, we ought to seek to acquire wisdom and understanding as you look to Christ, which will be demonstrated through our interactions and deeds. We're going to see this today in in three ways. First, the call to pursue wisdom. Second, wisdom is demonstrated outwardly. And then third, applying wisdom to our interactions and speech. So let's consider the first point, pursue wisdom. Notice James says in verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you. So here he gives a question to us all. It's not just limited to the teachers, it's to everyone. And he goes, do you consider yourself wise? Do you consider yourself to have understanding? If so, come on over here and let's evaluate your claim. This is a call to question yourself, to examine yourself, to see if you have true faith, to see if it shows in the wisdom of your life. Notice he also says, who is wise and understanding among you? He's referring to the gathering of believers here. He's referring to those who are gathering together, who have been redeemed to by the blood of Christ and are part of the local church. He's speaking to individuals within that church, but he's speaking to one another among you. So he says, who is wise among you? Who is wise in the way they live? Who is wise in the way they walk amongst the body of believers, in the way they communicate? And so James is calling for self-examination to see, are you wise? But also, as you consider yourself wise, would others in the body affirm it? Would they affirm it to be wise as well? And if you think about it, that's exactly as you're looking at teachers and elders, you're looking to see one of the qualities is Do they exhibit wisdom? So he says, who is that among you who is wise? So James is bringing this question to each of our conscience. Are we wise and would others agree? One person says, the Christian lives not in isolation, but in fellowship with the community in which God has placed him in. That community is first of all the church of Jesus Christ. True to her calling, the church stands in the midst of the world to let the light of the gospel shine forth. To function properly in their respective places, the Christian and the church need wisdom and understanding. So James asks, are you wise? Do you have understanding? Do you possess a godly wisdom or is it a worldly wisdom? Do you bear the mark of maturity and wisdom? And do others within your fellowship, do they see it in you? So he says, who is wise and understanding? We must first ask, what does he mean by that? What does he mean, wise and understanding? And to say wise, he's he's referring to wisdom. He's referring to wisdom. Now, he's not just asking, do you have a lot of knowledge? Do you have a lot of intelligence about a specific subject? Maybe you have a great knowledge of theology. Maybe you read a lot of books. That alone doesn't mean you have wisdom. There are plenty of people who have knowledge, There are plenty of people who have intelligence about specific subjects, 
but it doesn't mean they're wise. You can have a lot of knowledge and still be a fool. Biblical wisdom is the ability to live well, the ability to apply the knowledge of God and his will for you in all of life's circumstances. So these words, wise and understanding, are are two words that we can say are synonyms. They're very closely related, but they each have a particular emphasis in their meaning. To be wise in the Greek is the word sophos, so we would get the word sophia, which means moral insight and application of practical things. It's, It's knowledge, but knowledge applied. So wisdom is knowing how to apply the knowledge of Scripture and the principles that you have to any given situation that is going to produce godly life. It's the ability to see all of life from God's perspective and to act accordingly. What would he have me do? How does he want me to live in this specific situation and these circumstances in a way that gives him the glory? But then we also have the word understanding, and this refers to a specific knowledge, knowledge of a specialist. It's a specific knowledge that God wants you to have that comes by virtue of reading his word. It's his will for us. It's his revealed will. God wants us to know how we are to live and how we are to please him. He wants us to have a specific knowledge of the truth. He doesn't want you to be ignorant. So he wants you to have understanding, right? People perish because of lack of knowledge. God desires us to have knowledge. And so understanding, we can understand, is the knowledge of what to do or the knowledge of the truth. Wisdom is the proper application of that knowledge in all circumstances. So they go together. You can't be wise if you don't have knowledge. And you can't have an understanding if you're not wise. Now, these two words together, they they don't appear very often within Scripture. In fact, these are the only time in the New Testament you'll see this pairing, wise and understanding. But in the Septuagint, as you go back to the Old Testament, Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you find these together, and specifically in Deuteronomy 13 in the qualifications of a judge. A judge must be someone who is wise and understanding. But it's not limited only to judges. It's not limited only to teachers. It also describes what all the people of God are called to pursue. Hosea 14.9 says, Whoever is wise... Let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them. But the transgressors stumble in them. So to be wise in understanding is a call for all believers. It's a call for all people of God. So if you want to please the Lord, we need to have wisdom, and we need to have understanding. Now, some commentators will take this and say, okay, well, James is referring only to teachers here. Because if you look at the beginning of the chapter, he's the warnings to teachers. And so he's warning who is wise and understanding teachers among your midst. So some commentators take that. But I don't think that's, that's the right application here. I think James, actually, if you follow his argument, the flow of it, you would see, yes, he warns teachers, but then what does he do? He takes the warning about the tongue, and he doesn't just keep it at teachers. He broadens it to everybody. And as he broadens it to everybody, everyone who has a tongue needs to be warned. Everyone who has a tongue needs to control it. In the same way, everyone who is a child of God needs to have wisdom. I believe he's continuing to broaden it out to include anyone who seeks to be wise. So believers are called to be those who are wise and understanding. In fact, Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, 16, in the midst of persecution, how does he encourage you? I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise. Right? Be wise. Be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. So it's a call to be wise. That's not limited to only the disciples. That's for all of us. We're all called to grow in wisdom and understanding, and that only happens by the grace of God. In other words, it's a mark of spiritual maturity. Now, we, if we are to grow in that, we need to understand how it comes. Proverbs 1.7 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. 
So wisdom and understanding first starts by fearing God, having a holy fear of God, to believe he is true, to believe he is holy and good. And and that creates a reverent, holy fear. The book of Proverbs teaches us how to pursue wisdom in general and in particular. It's a great book to just read. There's great principles that apply to different situations in life. It's applying wisdom. Wisdom is good. It's noble. In fact, wisdom is an attribute of God. So as we pursue it, we're pursuing something that's good and pleasing in God's sight. Proverbs 3.19 says, The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. Romans 11.33, Paul, just considering the great wisdom of God, it provokes him to worship, right? He says this, Oh, the depths and riches of wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment, how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift that he might be repaid? For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. The wisdom of God provokes Paul to worship, but it also provokes him to want to grow in wisdom. And it should provoke us as well. Understanding that because of this, God is a source of all wisdom. And so we need to, if we're going to grow in it, we need to go to him for it. You can't go to the world to grow in wisdom. Proverbs 2, 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk in integrity. He gives wisdom because he's the source of all wisdom. So if you desire to be wise, if you desire to have understanding, you must go to him. You must ask him of it. Daniel 2.20, God is praising, or Daniel is praising God for being wise, for giving him wisdom, knowing that he's the source. He says, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings. He sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God, my Father, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom. So who is wise? Who is understanding among you? If you have true biblical wisdom, that the heavenly wisdom that James is going to describe here in the later part of the chapter, it's because you have received it from God. He is the source. Now, this isn't the first time James has spoken of wisdom. In fact, in chapter 1, we've heard this before. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given. And remember, that's in the context of dealing with trials, dealing with suffering. So trials are going to come to all people. What, What stands out is how do you endure through it? A wise Christian A a true Christian is one who doesn't look at trials as as a defeat, but is something we all go through, and he needs wisdom on how to endure through it. He says, if you're struggling through the trial, ask God for wisdom, and he'll graciously give to you wisdom. So wisdom is something good. It's something noble. It's something we ought to seek for. One person said this, no one can live without wisdom for no one wishes to be called stupid. Therefore, wisdom is treasured by those who have it and sought by those who lack it. Consider just a few verses of how the book of Proverbs uh, makes wisdom shine as something that we should desire. Proverbs 8.11, it says, For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. Proverbs 3.13, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom, and the one who gets understanding. And how do we find it? Well, we have to go to the Lord. He is the source of all wisdom. He gives graciously. You can't turn to the world to be wise. You can't rely on unbelievers to get you wisdom. You must turn to God and seek it from Him. And if you're to have a proper knowledge and understanding how to apply wisdom, how does he reveal it to us today? Well, it comes through his word. 
He tells us how to live, how to have wisdom and apply it to our life in his revealed word. One commentator said, wisdom is the means by which the godly can both discern and carry out the will of God. God gives us his revealed will for us in scripture. And as we seek to do those things, we are wise as the spirit works in our hearts to do them. If you know what God commands of you and what he, what you are to do for his glory, then you can start applying that to every different life situation and circumstance that you find yourself in. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is having a knowledge of what God requires and applying it to live a godly life. So who is wise and understanding among you? Do you claim to be wise? Do you claim to have wisdom? Right? We can all be wise in our own eyes. But how do you know what it looks like? There are many ways we can fool ourselves into thinking we have wisdom. We can be tempted to think we are wise simply because we are very clever. Simply because we maybe made better decisions in the past than others. We can think we're wise because we're really good at arguing or we win at debates. We can be tempted to think we're wise and mature because we maybe we've had this spiritual experience where you get this warm, fuzzy feeling that other Christians maybe haven't had yet. We can be tempted to think we're wise because we've been a Christian for a long time or because we've just gone to church all our lives or because we've read lots of books or been to Bible college or seminary or because we sat under a particular pastor or listened to everything he says online. If you assess yourself to be wise, would God say the same? So many of these things could be even good things. They're not a measure of wisdom. So James says, if you want to be wise, if you claim to be wise, let's examine it. Which brings us to the next point. Wisdom is demonstrated outwardly. Look again at verse 13. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in meekness of wisdom. So you claim to be wise, let's see you apply it in the things you do. If you think this might sound familiar, you, you're actually right. James is reflecting a lot of what he said in chapter 2. Pretty similar. Think of chapter 2.18. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. He says, you claim to be wise, show me your wise by the things you do. Very similar for what he's saying. In other words, your life will demonstrate the pattern of wisdom by the things you do, by the things you say, by your interactions, by your conversations. If you claim to be wise, just give enough time and we can discern. You can demonstrate it for all to see. Similar to what Jesus says, by your fruit, you will know them. Notice how he says to demonstrate it. Notice, by his good conduct. First off, notice, good according to who? Not according to our own minds, not according to our own standards, but that which God says is good by his word. He says, let's let the Bible examine your claims, your conduct. How you live will be demonstrated by your good conduct. Is it living in accordance with scripture, with how God commands you to do? If you have wisdom, it's confirmed by your Good conduct. This idea for good conduct means noble or praiseworthy behavior. It's seen through one's words. It's seen through one's deeds. And this word for conduct can be translated as behavior or lifestyle. 1 Peter 1.15 uses it this way. He says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So if you claim to have wisdom, it should be seen outwardly in accordance to scripture. It should be seen in your behavior. Your manner of life possess, uh, reveals how much wisdom you possess. So a person who says, yes, I have wisdom and understanding, but then their life doesn't produce godliness is a fool. It's worldly wisdom. And he's going to go on to talk about that next time. 
But one person said, just as James exhorts believers to demonstrate their faith through works, so he also calls for the demonstration of wisdom by godly living. The one who is truly wise in, in the Lord will show his works or fruit by blessing with his mouth and not cursing. It's an example of wisdom applied to speech. Let him show it in his works with meekness and wisdom. So James continues. He says, let him show it. And this is actually an imperative. It's a command. You claim to be wise? Do it. Show it. Reveal it by the way you live. Demonstrate it in your life. Wisdom is shown, notice, in the good works one does. Let him show it in his works. This is a call to effectively demonstrate outwardly for all to see. Wisdom is seen in its fruits and its deeds. Wisdom is described in the book of Proverbs. A life of beauty and excellence in every way is wisdom described in the family, in vocations, in finances, in friendships, in speech. There's many different ways and avenues in which wisdom can be applied in our life. Notice it's not just that he has works. It's not just that there is good works that it's producing, but it's the manner of how these works are done. Notice it says, in the meekness of wisdom. It's better to see this translated as this, as meekness which comes from wisdom. Wisdom produces meekness. As you're wise, as you are knowledgeable of what God's word says, and you're seeking to apply it, that ought to produce a sense of meekness in your life and in your deeds. Just as good works are the fruit of faith, meekness is the fruit of wisdom. And so he says, remember, these works and deeds are shown among you. They're around you in the fellowship and the body that you're doing these things, and others can see them, and they can verify, are they done in meekness? True wisdom will not be arrogant but meek. The word here for meek can be translated also as humble or gentle. It's the opposite of pride. It's the opposite of arrogance. It's the opposite of self-promotion. And that's why he says in the very next verse, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast or be false to the truth. In other words, that's not godly wisdom. It's worldly wisdom. If one's wise, it's going to be seen in him and his works It's carried out in humility every day. If you think you know it all and are prideful, he says that's not godly wisdom. That's worldly wisdom. Galatians 6.3, For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. What do you have that you have not received? No reason to boast. Godly wisdom is seen in the attitude of meekness. This is the same word Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. He says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that should be seen in the life of every believer. It's the attitude we need to have when we receive the word. Remember, he says in James 1.21, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So how do you receive the word? Is it one which thinking, I know it all, prideful, thinking you have nothing new to say to me? Or is it in meekness, Lord, what do you have to say to me today? So many in our culture prize and cherish pride and self-confidence and boasting But in James 4, he's going to go on to say, God gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's humility that God is after. It's a a fruit of the Spirit. And if you're really wise, if you think about it, you will be humble. Since the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom, you fear God, you understand how great He is, how magnificent He is, how holy He is, how little and insignificant you are, and how needy you are. You were dead in sin. You you could do nothing to save yourself, and God made you alive. He gave you life. He sent his son to redeem you. He's given you gifting 
to serve him and glorify him. You did nothing to deserve it. And you have eternal life through him. That should produce humility as you meditate on who God is. All the gifts and talents you have is because God gave them to you. Knowing that in and of itself should produce humility as you think about God, as you meditate on his word. And if you're humble towards God, then you ought to be humble towards one another in the things you do. Meekness is not consumed with their own self-importance. And this meekness will come out in how you treat others. If one has knowledge, but not good conduct or not godly wisdom, it's not true. If one has a knowledge, but it's not accompanied by meekness, it's worldly wisdom. And we as believers, we're not perfect, but that ought to be the pattern of your life. As you grow in your sanctification, you're growing in meekness, you're growing in wisdom and understanding. Now, there are many who think to themselves to be wise, to be mature believers, but fail in this biblical evaluation of wisdom. Rather, they have the worldly wisdom as their standard. They show their conduct as anything but meekness and gentle. And the conduct isn't limited, this meek behavior that he's talking about. The good deeds is not limited to merely actions, but also the things they say, the interactions they have. Wisdom is seen in their deeds. This is in, includes the writings. This includes posts online. And in a multimedia age, the internet age, it's saddening looking online, seeing supposed wise Christians show their conduct and works as anything but meekness and gentleness. It ought to be telling what kind of wisdom they possess. So may we be discerning. May we show ourselves to be wise by the things we do and say, by the things we post. Which brings us to the next point, applying wisdom in our interactions and speech. Look again at the verse. He says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Now, anyone have a King James Version? Okay. There should be a different translation here. And the different translation is this, by his good conduct. Instead, the word there for conduct is translated as conversation. Conversation. In other words, by his interactions, by his speech. And I think the idea there is understand the context in which James is writing. He, he just wrote all about the tongue, all about the speech that we have and the danger it has if left unguarded if left untamed. And so I really believe here, and I want to take time to just think about this, is the wisdom we have in our interactions and our conversations and our speech. We'll see more about wisdom throughout our deeds and works as we continue through this passage, but let's just marinate a bit on how this applies to our conversations, on how this applies to our speech with one another. Wisdom is seen in our deeds, which includes our tongue. So our speech ought to be noble. Our speech ought to be meek. And when we have conversations and interactions, especially within the body of Christ, it should show that we are humble. It should show that we are meek. It should show that we have wisdom. So I want to focus now on some principles that we can use in Scripture. Remember, what wisdom is, it's knowledge of the scripture, knowledge of what God requires and what he tells us in his word to then apply it to everyday living, particularly we'll apply it to our speech. And hopefully this can help us be wise in our speech and our interactions with one another. Now I do want to say I've been tremendously helped in my application of these uh, truths here through Pastor Al Martin. He has an excellent series uh, called The Bridal Tongue. And so I really commend that. And he relates this here to this wise and understanding. So I commend that to you. And so applying wisdom in our speech. One of the things that was interesting, um, 
me and Richard were talking after service yesterday, or last week about the golden rule and how that, repla- re- how that uh, relates to our speech. So I want to build off that a little bit more. And that our speech reveals our nature. Can you remember what Jesus says in Matthew uh, 12? I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words they will be justified, and by your words they will be condemned. So we'll all one day be held accountable for how we use our words. So we should be using our words wisely in, in meekness and humility. And Jesus is not saying, okay, you want to be justified? Just make sure you say a lot of good things and, and you'll, you'll make it in. He's not saying that. What he is saying is your words are the outward manifestation of your inward reality. In other words, your words vindicate you whether you have true faith or not. It, it shows you've been regenerated by the things you say. So in that sense, we can say your words will justify you. It will vindicate you. It will show you have true faith. Because you've been justified by grace through faith, it's going to show in your words. And on the last day, your words are the evidence of the inward reality or lack thereof. So if you've been regenerated, if you have true living faith, it's going to be demonstrated by the words you say. And and that's what James is building off of when he was talking about the the fresh spring and the salt spring. Because you can't have both. If you're a fresh spring, if you've been regenerated, it should produce fresh water. And that's what James and Jesus here are talking about. And I believe as we apply that golden rule, it really helps us be wise in our conversations and our speech. So the golden rule is seen in Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verse 12. And just to give you the context, it's the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is, is giving that sermon, uh, examining this is... This is what true religion looks like. It's grounded first in faith in Christ, and then it flows out with how you interact with one another. He says in Matthew 7, he says, Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. By saying this is the law of the prophets is is basically summing up the Old Testament. He says all that the law and the prophets wrote about Uh, can be summed up this way, loving your neighbor. We've heard Jesus say it this way. How do you read the law? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, right? This This is saying the same thing. And so, in light of these things, in light of the golden rule, loving God, loving neighbor, loving neighbor as what? Yourself. Relate that to your conversations. Relate that to your speech, your interactions that you have, and your conversations. So think about that. As as we are do well to think about that, as we have that in our minds, consciously aware of it, I think that will really inform our conversations with one another and help us to guard our tongue. Reflecting on the golden rule is helpful for our speech. So when, let's just say you're, you're speaking with someone here. How would you want someone to treat you? How would you want them to speak to you? Reflecting on the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So what would you prefer if you were standing in their shoes? How would you want them to speak to you? How would you want them to interact with you? And he says, that way, you do that to them. If you want to love your neighbor as yourself, put yourself first in their shoes and then treat them like that, how you would want to be treated. If you were them, how would you respond to them then? Whatever situation before you speak, see yourself first as in your neighbor's shoes. And don't be like the the rich young ruler, well, who's my neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor. Everyone you have interactions with is your neighbor. And so whatever situation, whatever circumstance, find yourself in your neighbor's shoes, in their situations, in their circumstances, and ask, how would I want to be treated if I were in their scenario? With everything you know about them, with their whole context, their circumstances, how would I want to be treated? 
And then once you do that, then reply. And then do exactly that, how you would want to be treated. Treat him as such. If the roles were reversed, speak. And as that relates to your tongue, that's going to drastically affect how you respond to others, how you interact with others. And this is really a key in conflict resolution. So many things, so many danger can happen because of an unbridled tongue, right? We've already talked about the fire and the damage and destruction. Just think if this one thing was in our minds before we reacted, before we spoke, before we, as James says, the venom that comes out of your your mouth, the poison of the tongue. Just think how much more that would be guarded. If someone has done something that offends you, how do you then respond? How do you converse with that? How you respond can drastically change and alter your relationship. You see this in families that they don't even talk to one another because of so many things that have happened because of the use of the tongue. Do you go in and demand your rights? Do you go in and respond angrily and harshly? Do you respond, maybe not respond at all and say, you know what, I'm just going to ignore them and give the silent treatment? All these are sinful ways in how to deal with that and how we refrain from using the tongue. Rather, Take time to think through the golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So if the roles were reversed, how would you wish they approached you? In gentleness and kindness, willing to hear you out before they draw their own conclusions, before they retaliate. How do you feel when someone comes harshly and angry at you without giving you the time of day to explain if you don't want to be treated with like that, why do we treat others like that? Why do we do this with family? How much less conflict, how much less division would result if we just used that simple principle and applied it to our conversations? Ephesians 4 says this, verse 31, Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. He goes on, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such is good for the building up that fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Do your words give grace? He goes on, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So your conversations are motivated by the gospel. Because you've meditated on the scriptures, you understand his golden rule, you understand the good news of, this is how Christ treated me, so I want to treat others in the same way and speak to them how I want to be treated. Because that's how Christ treated me. How much better communication with spouses would be? Right? We wouldn't have marriage counseling anymore. Husbands, coming home from work before you sit down, relax, sit on that couch, go in your zone, go work on the car, get on the phone. First, put yourself in the shoes of your wife. What has she gone throughout the whole day? What has she endured? Maybe working with the kids, working at work, running around, doing errands to provide uh, for the different needs of the home. If you were her before she comes to you and asks, why are you sitting down? Put yourself in her shoes. How would you want to respond if you were in her situation. Or vice versa, wife, your husband's been at work all day, working hard to provide, you've been at home with the kids. Put yourself in his shoes before you snap at him while he's not doing the dishes or something. The kind of wisdom of speech is referring to the control of the tongue. It comes by knowing what God's word says seeking to then imply it in all of life's situation by the power of the Spirit working in you. So if you want to work in wisdom, you need to read his word to know how to apply the different commands he gives us in any situation. And just by using this golden rule again, it it informs us what we ought to not say. Right? When someone speaks about you, when someone speaks about you, How do you want them to speak about you? Truth, lies, slander. When someone assumes something about you that's not true, doesn't come to you for clarification, but rather talks about it with others, gossips, spreads slander, draws their own conclusions, how does that make you feel? So rather than do that, 
put yourself in their shoes, how would I want them to be treated? That should inform the things you say and don't say. We're so quick to do that with others. So whatever you wish others do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Even in matters of reproof and correction, it matters how you do it. Proverbs 12, 18, there is the one whose rash words are like a sword thrust, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Right? How many parent, children, or relationships have been hindered because of the rash word of correction and, and, and sharpness? Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. How much conflict could be resorted if just the tone of the response was gentle? How we speak to one another matters, and it's a display of the wisdom we have. Do you have wisdom? Do you have understanding? So whatever you wish others do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And this understanding should help us refrain from speaking negative things. Ephesians 5 says, But sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you. It's improper for the saints. Let there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, no crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So sarcasm, teasing, put-downs, that shouldn't even be named among the people of God. And when you do that, it shows a lack of wisdom, a lack of understanding. It's a reflection of worldly wisdom. So there's so much more we could continue to say in applying these things, but that's just an application of, of some of the truths in Scripture and how you can apply it in different circumstances in light of our speech. Think of all different areas of life, how, too, we can use that. But as we close, everything we have said about wisdom is perfectly reflected in Jesus. He, he is our greatest, wisest man. He was the most perfect, humble man. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Colossians 1.3, In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want to know what it is to be wise? Look to Jesus. He didn't just claim to have wisdom. He lived it absolutely perfectly, showing that he truly was wise. And he did it in humility. He was accused and slandered, yet it showed he was wise in how he dealt with people. There were times he did rebuke, but there were times he actually didn't even open his mouth. Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, the accusers, he said, the son of man came eating and drinking. They say to him, look, a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collector and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. You can look at Christ's life and say, yep, he was a wise one by the way he dealt with these things. His conduct wasn't just good, it was perfect. He met the perfect standard. He exemplified true wisdom. He exemplified peace, a gentleness, a reasonableness, mercifulness, unwavering sincerity. And so he's our ultimate example of meekness. He came gentle and humble in heart. And he perfectly modeled this for you and me. But because of our failure, because we were really fools, we paid the punishment of fools, which Proverbs talks about is the end is destruction and death. So Jesus came and he was treated like a fool. He took our curse upon himself. He died a gruesome death so that we could be accepted as those who have the wisdom of God. He endured the punishment. and he, he calls us and says, take my yoke. Learn from me, for I am what? Gentle or meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. We are called to then be wise out of love and gratitude for what he has done for us because he's equipped us with wisdom by giving us his Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1 says this. Just think of Ephesians where Paul just enamors about the great salvation we have and how God has orchestrated our salvation. 
listen to how he focuses on wisdom. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. So we who are united to him, we are enabled to be wise. We are actually called to be wise as we meditate on the truths of his word and apply the knowledge that we have to all of life. And you have the ability because you've been regenerated and you have the Holy Spirit in you. So are you wise and understanding? What does your conduct say about your wisdom? Is it an earthly wisdom or a heavenly wisdom? Maybe you're listening to this and thinking, man, I haven't really been wise. How do I be wise? Well, wisdom is found only in Christ. Look to him. Wisdom is found in him. He is the perfect example of wisdom. Of wisdom. So act, ask God for wisdom. Ask him to produce in you a, a humble heart. Seek wisdom through his word. That's where you find knowledge and understanding. And then the Holy Spirit working in your life will produce wisdom. The more you know, the more you're able to apply it. And then once you know wisdom, share wisdom with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Encourage one another to walk in wisdom, to have conversations in wisdom and humility. And as we do that, we're looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, who is fully wise, leaving you a pattern to follow. So if you are to be mature Christians, we ought to seek to acquire wisdom and understanding as you look to Jesus, which is a demonstration which will be demonstrated through our interactions and deeds. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. And just this time, just meditating on wisdom. Lord, we can read so much in the Proverbs, Psalms, much of Scripture speaks of wisdom. Lord, equip us to be those who are wise, not in our own eyes, but in your eyes, according to your standard out of meekness and humility, knowing that it's not us because we were so special. It's not us because we were so wise and, and because we, out of our own strength, deserved it. But because you granted it, that we should be those who give you the glory, producing us a humble heart, knowing we are nothing without you. So Lord, help us, for, forgive us, our times when we were unwise, when we were unpatient and impatient in our words, when we were not humble but prideful. Lord, forgive us our sins. We thank you that Christ has indeed paid for them. Out of love and gratitude, help us now to live for him, speaking words of wisdom and deeds of wisdom for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.